Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And while you're turning, let me say, pray for Josh as we're praying for these other folks that are battling difficulties. You know, he had a root canal three weeks ago now. He has, uh, as a result of it, he has lost feeling in, is it the left side of your, left side of his mouth, left half of his tongue. For the life of me, I don't know how you sing with half a mouth, feeling in half a mouth and feeling in half a tongue. I don't understand that except to say thank you, Lord, that you're helping him to do that. So we want to pray that God will restore what he has lost vocally. You remember, that you, those of you who were here years ago now, I don't know, maybe eight, ten years ago now, I experienced something where I began to lose my voice. And went through that for a season where I had to cut back and preach only in the mornings. And if you were here, you remember it was pretty rough to, to, uh, to listen to. Uh, so pray for him that God will touch him and heal him. Also pray for our friends and our, our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina. They are taking a beating. Not so much as the force of the hurricane that came ashore, but the aftermath of it. It is sitting on the coast, churning out rains and floods, surges, and it's just devastating. And we've got many friends who are pastors of churches out there, so remember to pray for them as well. I'm excited about the Wednesday night study. Don't know how familiar you are with Psalm 119. I encourage you to look at it sometime this week, perhaps today, and your Bibles probably have it broken down by paragraphs, it looks like, and there's a word up at the top of it, it's an unusual word, it's the, it's, it's the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Beth, Gamel, Dalet, and, and it's, what it is, it's a, it's a fascinating mnemonic device, where in the first paragraph, I think it's verses 1 to 8, every, think about this now, the first word of every line, the first letter of the first word of every line begins in Aleph. Drop down to the second paragraph. The first letter of the first word in every line begins in Beth. That would correspond to our, our A and our B. And it follows on down. It's a, it's a brilliant, spirit-inspired masterpiece that ransacks the Hebrew language to discuss and to, to rejoice in and, and describe and magnify the Word of God. And if there's a passage of Scripture that milks the essence of what we mean by the all-sufficient Word of God, that's it. Hope you'll join us for that study on Wednesday nights. I'm excited about it. And certainly a great provocation to pray. 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to read verses 1 to 13. I ask you to stand with me as, as we read. I'm going to read this entire passage. And we're going to be zeroing in on the, on the rest of chapter 13, verses 8 and following today. We have dealt for several weeks now with this idea of love. I hope that you are saturated with it, washed over with it, hiding it in your heart, practicing it in your life. We're going to look now at why Paul went to such lengths to describe it. Well, follow along as I read this, please. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong. Or a clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. In today's consideration. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. What we just read together. The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May we understand and so nail down some things today. Why Paul said what he said about love and what he was going after dealing with the Corinthian abuse of the charismata of the spiritual gifts so that we will know, we'll be wise on how to live in our context in this part of the country concerning these things. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you as we've gone through this passage, this, it breaks down into three uh, headings. The necessity of love, verses 1 to 3. The excellence of love, verses 4 to 7. Then the perpetuity of love. In other words, how love continues. Now, he presses the idea that love continues because he's going to speak to some things that don't continue. Corinth, the church at Corinth, many problems. We're not practicing the spiritual gifts given to believers in regeneration. When you're born again, there is implanted in you by the Spirit various charismata, various grace gifts to be used, we've already studied this, for the building up of the body, to edify, to strengthen, to encourage, to advance the mission and ministry of the local church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were not doing that. <clears throat> so Paul has to chide them about that. And this is what he does. Concluding his thoughts on love, he says in chapter 13, verse 8, love never ends. We looked at that last week, but that love keeps on loving. You tell me you stopped loving somebody, I will tell you you really never loved them. Not this way. Now you may have loved them with a friendship love and you didn't feel like they were being good friends so the friendship split. You may have loved them with a physical love. But you love somebody with agape love, that unconditional love. You don't stop loving them. They turn your back, their back on you, you love them. They betray you, you love them. That's what agape does power of it. I told you this passage is, a, is a, a portrait of the life of Jesus Christ. And so Paul has set this before the Corinthians and, and we certainly value and benefit today from studying it. Love never ends. It keeps on loving. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Paul uses two different words here. We're going to look at this in a few minutes. There's a reason he uses two different words. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, we'll have to decide what the perfect is, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Basically what he's teaching here is you Corinthians are acting like children. Grow up. When I became a man, I matured, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, or we see in a, in, a, in a darkened mirror. But then, face to face, now versus then. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, the greatest of these is love. And so Paul has contrasted the spiritual gifts with the, with the ongoing reality of love. Manifesting itself throughout time and eternity. You get into heaven, you don't stop loving. As you get into heaven, you're really able to unleash agape love like you were not on earth because on earth you had these hindrances, these, these besetting sins, these remaining sins. 
Not so in heaven. Paul strengthens his emphasis on the supreme nature of love. And that's what he's going for. And we're going to see that when we get to chapter 14 where he's, where he's going to contrast the more meaningful gifts or charismata with the, with the less important charismata. He contrasts here love's permanence with the, with the impermanence of the temporary nature of three spiritual gifts, specifically. They represent the remarkable gifts. Prophecy, tongues, by implication, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge. Each of these gifts will eventually fall and disappear, but love will never end. We're told here that all three would cease. And there's two different verbs. It's on purpose. Paul's not going for style here. He's not, he's not under the inspiration of the Spirit trying to, be, uh, trying to be different, use different words. He is going after something here. Prophecy and knowledge will be done away. Tongues will cease. When he says prophecy, prophecies will pass away. Having served his purpose, it will be brought to an end. The, the word here, the verb done away, which means, it means to reduce to inactivity, to abolish. Prophecy and knowledge, we'll get to that in a moment, one day will be made inoperative. These are passive verbs. Something or someone will act upon prophecies and knowledge to cause them to stop. That something is the coming of the perfect. We'll deal with that in a little bit. Paul uses a different word for tongues. Cease. They will cease. It means to stop, to come to an end. I'm not going to bog you down in the grammar here. But the, the force of the verb speaks of the intentional, voluntary action upon a matter. You could call it a self-causing action. The cause comes from within. I think it was John MacArthur. I found great, great help in John MacArthur's commentary. I would commend it to you on this section. He says that, that the nature of tongues identified here in this verb to cease helps us understand that it had a built-in stopping place that gift will stop by itself would be a way to render what Paul is saying here it's like a battery it has a limited energy supply a limited lifespan we're dealing with something of a phenomena here we apparently have a bad batch of batteries that are green when they're put in this in the morning. They're green when I walk up here. When I get up to come up here, and you see the red light, that means their shelf life has come to an end. They're useless. That's what Paul's saying about tongues here. When the limitations reached, the activity ends. The distinction, prophecy and knowledge will be stopped by something happening outside of those realities. Tongues will stop by itself. You cannot deny the distinction. 
Prophecies will pass away. Tongues will cease. We're going to deal with this a little more here. Knowledge will pass away. Same verb. He's, he's used pass away, cease for tongues, then pass away again. Knowledge is the secret information. We talked about this when we looked at this in, in the, about God. And when, when that secret information is, comes into complete form in the scriptures, there is no need for further secret information about God. He has revealed all he intends to reveal to us in his word. In the Old Testament, prophetically anticipating the coming of Messiah. In the New Testament, re reflectively capturing the essence of the coming of the Messiah. The life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ told to us in the Gospels. Then in the Acts, the coming of the Holy Spirit as Jesus promised to carry the church forward. In the letters of the of the New Testament, we're going through one of these each Sunday night, telling us what that means. All the knowledge God intends to give us is captured in this book. And I want to say this as charitably as I can. Anyone who comes to you with knowledge that they say is extra biblical is lying. Let God be true and every man a liar. Some people come with knowledge, they would say God gave them, but if you if you recognize there are things that are in this in the scripture. Knowledge will cease, will pass away, I mean. So when and how will these gifts end? Prophecy and knowledge are said to end when the perfect comes. The word perfect there is a word that we would also recognize as complete. Coming to completion. He goes on and says, and I want to touch on this before we, before we dig down into this idea of tongue ceasing. We know in part, we prophesy in part. There's a, there's a knowledge, prophecy. When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. The partial knowledge, partial prophecy. When, when the Word of God, and I, I think there are two viable options, but I really believe the Word of God, I think it's Walt Chantry in his excellent book, Signs of the Apostles, suggests that it's the canon of scripture when the canon of scripture comes into into its completion that the idea of going around saying thus saith the lord uh, on your own without thus saith the lord anchoring it to the scriptures that it is it is not appropriate when the perfect comes another alternative is that the perfect is the is the consummation of the age Whichever it is, it has nothing to do with the cessation of tongues. Tongues is not attached in this passage to, to being brought to completion passively by something coming into reality. The word used for tongues is that tongues will end on its own. So let's think about why would we say that now as we live today, tongues has ceased. And I want to use the word has, has essentially ceased. I told you when we started this study that I'm, a, I'm an almost absolute cessationist. <laughs> okay. Now the reason I say that is, is because I'm only Bill Askell. I don't sit in judgment upon God. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he well pleases. 
and none can stay his hand or say to him, why are you doing what you're doing? But I believe we can say that in our day, in our culture, with a preponderance of various means of scripture available to us, knowledge has ceased, prophecies in terms of, of predictive foretelling, foretelling prophecies have come to an end. Extra biblical knowledge has come to an end. Tongues have ceased. And again, I commend you to John MacArthur. He's has one of the best sections. I've read a lot of commentaries through the years, other than Walt Chantry's small book, Signs of the Apostles. And I would commend to you also John MacArthur's book, Charismatic Chaos. Both are excellent in addressing this. But in his commentary, he has, he has some very well-reasoned ideas about this. And I want, I want to go to that rather than try to improve upon it. Can't be improved upon. Listen to what he says here. First place, signs, the tongues, was a sign gift. And these things historically went off of the scene when the New Testament was completed. Remember, I told you when we were studying through Mark that Jesus performed miracles as a window through which you could see that he is the Son of God. Paralytic, remember? Brought by his friends and dropped into the front of into the presence of Jesus all over the roof. He looks at the man, he sees his friends, he says to the man, Your sins are forgiven you. Wasn't what they were going for, but it was a fantastic declaration. They murmur in the crowd, so, who is who can forgive sins but God? This man's a blasphemer. Jesus knows what they're saying. He says, Why are you? Murmuring among yourselves these things. Which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Or rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise, take up your bed and walk. He tells us right there why he does miracles. To prove. And when the New Testament comes into completion... We have the witness of Jesus and the apostles testifying to how he is the Son of God. Now, God's not ceased to perform miracles. You and I know that. There are people sitting in here who have been on the receiving end of the miraculous hand of God. But it does not manifest itself in so-called healing ministries. If you ever bump into one of these fellows who has, has a healing ministry, ask him if he's been to St. Jude Hospital. I'm not being facetious here. Brothers and sisters, if I was convinced God had given me the ministry of healing, I would fly to St. Jude as quickly as I could. And I would go room to room. Floor by floor. Touching those precious little children. Rise. Walk. If a man or woman who tells you they have the gift of healing will not do that. Or you suggest that to them and they start throwing down all sorts of caveats. All sorts of disclaimers. Well, it will When you study the scriptures carefully, there were three periods of what we would call miraculous periods in history. The first was Moses and Joshua. Of course, we remember the powerful miracles God enabled Moses to perform before Pharaoh. The second was in the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. Again, if you read those, those stories, miracles attended them. The third section, the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. MacArthur makes the observation that if you study the chronology here, each period lasted about 70 years of the, of the miraculous downpour, the unusual manifestation of the miracle-making 
wonder and power of God. Have you ever thought about that the last miracle recorded in the New Testament, you know what it, what it was? The last miracle recorded in the New Testament. See, people, people that talk about uh, being able to do miracles today, they talk as if it's just happening all through the New Testament. The last recorded miracle in the New Testament is Acts 28.8. It happened, we're told, that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery, and Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. That's about 58 AD, if you understand your New Testament chronology. 58 AD. When you get to the end of the New Testament, about 95, 96 AD, when the book of the Revelation is completed, not another miracle is recorded. In fact, you find things like this. Paul, who, who healed uh, the father of Publius, will write, I left so-and-so at Miletus sick. Just as Jesus performed miracles to confirm that he is the Son of God able to forgive sins, the age of miracles in the New Testament was for the purpose of confirming that the word as given by Jesus and the apostles was true and could be believed. Look at Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. It says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. He's talking about this, this New Testament era. Hebrews was written around 67, 68 AD. The writer uses verb forms here that speak of these things as past. In fact, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, where, where Walt Chantry gets the title for his book, says the signs of a true apostle were performed past among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Past tense used about these powers. The second thing that MacArthur suggests as evidence that the gift of tongues ended with the apostles is that its purpose as a judicial sign of, of Israel's judgment ceased to apply at that time. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 21. Compare and contrast that with Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. Paul says, In the law it is written by people of strange tongues, and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Look at Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people, to whom he has said, This is rest. Give rest to the weary, and this is repose. Yet they would not hear. Paul is citing that in 1 Corinthians 14, where he's arguing for the superiority of, of preaching to the inferiority of tongues. Isaiah 28 and magnified by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14. God is saying that because Israel refused to listen and believe when God spoke to them in a clear language, the prophet said the day would come when he would speak to them in a language they could not understand as a testimony against their rejection of him. Sounds like an awful lot like Babel, doesn't it? First Corinthians 14, 22 will tell us when we get there that, that tongues were given not as a sign to believers, but to unbelievers, but particularly unbelieving Jews, as this passage in Isaiah teaches. When Judaism ended, we looked at this in our, in our study of the intertestamental period. When Ju Judaism ended by the Roman general Titus destroying the temple in 70 A.D., Well, it continues as a major religion today. It ended as a, as a religion used by God. 
70 AD. The third consideration, as Paul will teach in 1 Corinthians 14, tongues are an inferior means of edification. If the, if the gifts are for building up the body, edifying the body, listen to Paul. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, verse 12 and 13, verse 27, 28. Listen to what he says. And I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Notice edification there. Verses 12 and 13. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. I want to just ask yourself, is what I'm doing with my life, Building up the church, because if, if it's not, then you are not practicing the purpose of the charismata. And Paul would say to you, I have the same problem with you, I have the church at Corinth. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. In other words, if, if you're not, not going to edify believers. 1 Corinthians 14, 27, 28. If, I, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only one or two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself to God. If you can't use the charismata, the spiritual gift, to edify and build up the church, be quiet. And we'll, we'll go through all of this when we get to chapter 14, so I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Fourth, the gift of tongues has ceased because its purpose as a confirming sign of apostolic authority and doctrine ended when the New Testament was completed. I do believe, as I said, I think when, the, when that which is perfect has come, when the, when the canon is complete, when the revelation of God has been put down in written form so that it can be passed on and communicated generation to generation, then the purpose as a confirming sign ceases. This is the confirming sign now. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation 22, 18, and 19. The warning against adding anything. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, book of Revelation. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The final chapters of the scripture or the book of the revelation adding to it places you under the judgment of God to have the plagues described there added to you coming up short of it taking taking away from it brings you into a, a different kind of judgment from God another consideration a fifth one is that the use of tongues is mentioned only in the earlier New Testament books. Most New Testament books do not even mention tongues. Paul mentions it in this letter. James, Peter, John, Jude, and they make no mention of it at all. After chapter 19, verse 6 of the book of Acts, no mention is made of tongues. Now see, follow me here. Tongues would cease. The life expectancy, the shelf life, the battery life of tongues was going to run out. And after Acts 19, 6, in terms of New Testament chronology through the book of Acts, the battery has run out. Tongues ceased to be practiced before the end of the apostolic age. Before the end, before the, before the completion of the canon of scripture. Nowhere is a believer commanded 
this responsibility is placed upon him or her as a spiritual exercise. In fact, you're going to see in chapter 14, it is downplayed. When you study history beyond the New Testament, beyond the scriptures, tongues has only reappeared occasionally uh, with, with questions and clouds over it when it has. It's typically attached to times of, uh, of a superseding of experience over the authoritative witness of scripture. If you follow, if you know your, your church history, you know that you had the apostolic age, that the age of the apostles. Then you had, you had the age following that where, where the men who wrote, we call them the church fathers, they were the disciples of the apostles. That's critical. These would be the people who were, who were taught the things of God by eyewitnesses to the Christ. Nowhere in the works of the church fathers, and they are voluminous, is the gift of tongues alluded to or found in any writers. That would include Clement of Rome. Who wrote to Corinth in 95 AD, about 40 years after Paul wrote, he makes no mention of tongues. One writer says that gives us hope that they had corrected the abuse as Paul brought it to their attention and the abuse had ceased. Justin Martyr, another church father, visited many of the churches of his day wrote many volumes. There's not a mention of tongues in any of his writings. Not even when he lists spiritual gifts. Origen makes no mention of tongues in his writings. In fact, when he's writing against someone named Celsus, he argues that the sign gifts of the apostolic age were temporary and not exercised by Christians of his day. Chrysostom, writing on 1 Corinthians 12, in his commentary, states that tongues and others' miraculous gifts not only had ceased, but could not even be accurately defined. Augustine, Commenting on Acts 2, 4, wrote, In the earliest times the Holy Spirit fell on them that believed, and they spoke with tongues. These were signs adapted to that time, for there behooved to be that betokening of the Spirit. That thing was done for betokening, and it passed away. And you can go, you can go all the way through, just moving through time. You have to come up to the 17th or 18th centuries when this type of manifestation shows up in Roman Catholic groups in Europe, the Seminoles and the Jansenists, and among the Shakers in New England. Followers of Irving in the 19th century, they were in London, were marked by revelations and tongue speak, they called it. For about 1,800 years, when you do your church history, this gift of tongues, along with the other remarkable and miraculous gifts, was unknown in the life and doctrine of Orthodox Christianity. Then around the 20th century, the turn of the 20th century, it became a major emphasis within the holiness movement, developing into what we know as modern Pentecostalism. <clears throat> The charismatic movement, which began in 1960, carried the practice even beyond traditional Pentecostalism and to other denominations. You may recall, <clears throat> if you've kept apprised of these things, the, the so-called uh, charismatic renewal in, the, in Roman Catholicism. 
Now I could go on and on, but I think you see why an honest approach to Scripture without reading anything into it leads you to the conclusion that prophecies and knowledge have passed away at the completion of this book. And if someone says, well, I don't believe that's what it means. Well, at the end of the age, it certainly will mean that. Tongues, different from knowledge and prophecies, has ceased. Well, how do we explain what we see around us today? God willing, I intend to take that up the next time we gather. This wicked generation is always looking for a sign. Only one sign will be given it. The sign of Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days. So will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth. The life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ is all we need to confirm the gospel. To say we need more is to undermine the preciousness of Jesus Christ and the authority and full sufficiency of Scripture. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in Jesus' name today. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for capable people who, through the centuries, have, have been faithful to your word. That we really stand on the, on the shoulders of giants in ages gone past. Pray that you will help us today to get a handle on this phenomena that seems to be all around us, particularly in this part of the country, and yet is not that phenomenal in the story of the New Testament. Help us to understand, to find the tension and the balance, to make much of Jesus Christ and little of uh, experiential manifestations, because Christ, as we sang, is, is all we need. He is enough and more than enough. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together.